Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. We're in the final days before the most important election, certainly in my time, and I think in all of our lifetimes, on November 3rd. My guests today are two young, I mean that only in the best possible way, uh, young climate activists who are turning their activism on the issue of climate change to electoral politics, not just at the presidential level, but all the way down the down ballot. Uh, this generation very well may be the difference in the outcome of many elections, not only in the presidential context next week, and how they're doing it and why they're doing it and where they're going and where their futures are taking them in electoral politics is the future of electoral politics in this country. And uh, I would venture to say the, the future of democracy in our country. So stay tuned as my guests, Violet Marie Vericker and my very own Olivia Freewald join me on this episode of Good Law, Bad Law. Stay tuned. And if you haven't already, please vote. Thank you. Well, there have been a number of studies in the last several days, including one from Harvard, talking about how this year the youth vote in next week's election could break all records. And if history shows that that's true, there's no question it will be climate change. That's the issue that has brought so many young voters out to get involved in this, uh, in this election year. So I've invited two climate activists working on the election to be on the podcast today and talk about the work they're doing. I want to welcome both of you, uh, Violet Massey Vericker and my own daughter, Olivia Freewald. Welcome both of you. Hi, thanks for having me, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so excited. I've been wanting to do this, uh, Olivia, you know, for months now. And here we are literally days away from, from this historic election. And uh, this, this really is uh, the election of a lifetime, although for you both, this is, I think, the first election for president anyway that you've been able to vote in. But you've been working on electoral politics uh, for a number of years. Why don't we start? Uh, each of you give just a little introduction to yourself and what, you're, what brought you to the work that you're doing. And then I want to get into some of the specifics of the kind of work that you guys are involved in. Violet, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah. Um... This is exciting because I haven't really thought of how to condense this before, but um, yeah, I think a lot of folks in my family um, have been really politically engaged and invested and it was very much like just I grew up in a culture of um, yeah being civically engaged and excited about reading the news and excited about learning about what our government was up to and how it was affecting us. Um, and I remember being about six years old and my mom <laughs> having me run up with flyers that she had written up about how incredible Obama was and all his great policies and going like, go, go, Violet, and me having to run up in the sweltering heat in Los Angeles and leave it on people's doorsteps. Um, and that, I guess, was kind of the start. Um, and then, yeah, in high school, I definitely got more involved. Um, I got involved with a local progressive group in my town just outside of New York City. Um, and yeah, we, after Trump was elected, yeah, after Trump was elected, we realized that, um, yes, we lived in a blue state, but our municipal government was blue, or, or sorry, our municipal government was red, our county government was red, and our state government was red. And so we were like, huh, maybe we aren't in such a blue state. And so we started working on these local and state elections and began alongside a bunch of other um, grassroots organizations in the area began to start to flip the um, village boards, the town uh, board, and then the county, and then the state legislature in 2018. And that was kind of when I got started to get really involved. And yeah, this past year, I took a year off. I was really excited to work on the 2020 election and got involved with Sunrise uh, in New Hampshire um, in January. That's where I met Olivia. And yeah, I've been kind of throwing down, doing voter contact um, for Bernie for a few months until the lockdown and then yeah got involved with down ballot disruption and haven't looked back <laughs> well we're going to talk more about what down ballot disruption is and what uh sunrise is for people who don't know but but just very basically how old are you where do you go to school when yeah so I'm, oh yeah i'm um i'm 19 years old and i'm currently 
attending Zoom Academy, <laughs> Zoom University, uh, and McGill University in Montreal. All right. And Olivia, tell us a little bit about yourself and, of course, how old you are and where you go to school and your, just a little bit of your background. Yeah, I'm 21. I go to Tufts University outside of Boston. And um, I really got involved with politics after my senior year of high school, um, connecting my passion for environmentalism that really was there for my whole life, as long as I can remember, in little ways. Um, and that turned political when I went to the People's Climate March um, in DC after Trump was inaugurated and there was a lot of mobilizations in DC. Um, and yeah, seeing thousands and thousands of people who cared about climate change like I did was really the first time that I felt like it wasn't all on my shoulders. So that was really powerful. And um, that's also where I got involved with Sunrise because my coach in getting a bus of folks down to the march um, was one of the founders of Sunrise. So that was kind of a coincidence, um, a happy coincidence that got me into um, the Sunrise movement. And um, I decided to take a semester off from school, from college um, during the midterm season in 2018. And that's when I first was trained on electoral organizing through Sunrise. Um, I organized for six months in a movement house in Downingtown, which is like 45 minutes west of where I grew up um, and learned so much during that time. Uh, and I didn't really realize it, but that also sparked my passion for down ballot organizing, especially um, because I was helping to elect Danielle Friel Otten, who was running for state representative for Pennsylvania. And she had never been a politician before and she took the no fossil fuel money pledge and she was a supporter of the Green New Deal before it was even the Green New Deal. Um, and yeah, this little house of like five organizers working full time knocked a few thousand doors and that ended up being the margin of victory for her against this Republican incumbent who had been there for years and years. So yeah, that was again really transformative and has been really foundational to like starting the down ballot disruption project and giving other small groups of organizers with limited experience but a ton of passion and drive um, the resources and training to be able to do that for down ballot leaders in their communities so i took another year off this year from college um, I didn't realize how convenient that would be um, with COVID, <laughs> but yeah, met Violet in New Hampshire, working um, to elect Bernie and then working with her and a few others on the Down Ballot Disruption Project ever since. All right, so, so for people who don't know, what is Sunrise, big, big organization, and what is the Down Ballot Disruption Project that you're both involved in? But, all right, so Violet, why don't you tell us about what Sunrise is, and then Libby, you can describe the, the down ballot disruption. Yeah, definitely. And Olivia, definitely fill in the cracks where I have any. Um, but yeah, Sunrise, uh, as it is always kind of talked about in the one-liner, is a movement of young people across the country uh, fighting to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. Um, it was formed in 2016 when a number of leaders in the student divest movement on um, college campuses across the country felt that, um, yeah, Obama wasn't moving quickly enough in terms of fighting for clean energy and Hillary Clinton didn't have any good climate plans. And so, yeah, there needed to be a youth movement that represented the stake that young people have in this crisis and to um, use direct action as well as um, youth political engagement to demand, um, yeah, solutions and policies to address this crisis and this problem um, at the scale it demanded. And that was before Trump got elected. So yeah, it's, as I understand it, um, after Trump got elected, started, there are about 20 or so hubs across the country, um, sort of chapter 
organizations uh, in key areas that were working with the DNA and um, research that the Sunrise Movement founders had done on movement organizing um, and how that had changed uh, the American political system in the past. Um, and yeah, kind of acted on that in local contexts. And then that was kind of, I think, as, as those 20 or so hubs across the country grew in a lot of key cities, that was what um, led to Sunrise Semester for 2018 uh, to work on the midterm elections and elect climate champions down the ballot, uh, including like, um, uh, what Olivia was saying, uh, including Danielle Phil Otten and AOC and a number of others. Uh, and that was hugely successful and ended with um, the Pelosi sit-in a week after the midterm elections. Um, and that was explosive as it was hundreds of Sunrise organizers coming from across the country to really switch the narrative. And I actually remember seeing Sunrise at that time. I, I first came into contact with them in July 2018, but didn't get involved for another year or so. But I remember seeing um, coverage of that and was so shocked because it was the first time where young people, progressive young people my age were angry at Democrats. <laughs> and like, I never really experienced that before at that scale and, and with that kind of anger and force behind it. Um, and it was just, I think it was a wake up call for so many people across the country and in the climate movement um, about, yeah, about the climate crisis and how it affected our country and how leaders that, you know, Nancy Pelosi, who we regarded as this like feminist icon and democratic leader and who was about to be the new Speaker of the House, um, was actually completely failing on this issue. And yeah, it also helped that freshman newly elected um, Congresswoman uh, AOC joined the sit-in. Uh, and yeah, so after that, Sunrise exploded into about 200 hubs across the country and has been growing ever since. Um, yeah, I think that's most of everything. Is it true? Because AOC gets a lot of credit for promoting the Green New Deal and, and, and issues of climate change and green jobs and all, all that's part of that. But really, it was Sunrise that, that originally put forth that concept. Was, isn't that the case? As I understand it, I think the Green New Deal had been, there had been discussions about what a Green New Deal could look like and Sunrise um, was very much founded with like coming from the divest movement, but then like latched onto the Green New Deal and we're like, this is what we're gonna be championing and fighting for. Um, and it still blows my mind that AOC's very first piece of legislation, like as soon as she got in office was the Green New Deal. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that uh, Sunrise put it on the map in a lot of ways. Okay, and so Olivia, you told us a little bit about what the work you did in 2018 and, and Violet, you too, in, in your local community. I think so many people think getting involved in politics means voting, you know, voting for who the next president is gonna be. But obviously in every community across the country, there are many, many important elections that take place on the same day. So what is, what is the concept of down ballot disruption. How did you come up with this? What is it you're trying to do? And how does that connect with, with getting young people engaged? That's a lot. I know that was about four questions. That is a lot. <laughs> um, I'll do my best though. So the concept of the Down Ballot Disruption Project came um, partly from the moment we were experiencing within Sunrise in the movement internally and also within the presidential election um, where it became clear that Bernie was not going to be the nominee um, and that Biden was most likely to be the Democratic nominee. So there was that moment um, of, you know, how, how are we going to turn out young people to vote at the scale that is required um, to beat Trump and make sure that he does not get a second term because that's out of the question. While Biden is now our, the leader of the Democratic Party and, you know, the person that we're presenting to beat Trump when before Bernie had this huge, huge base and following and energy behind him from young people. Um, so that was coupled with a feeling of there being this huge gap in Sunrise where 
um, there were all these endorsements of U.S. Senate candidates and congressional candidates and a lot of energy and um, power, like people power from our movement being put behind those races and it being really successful, but not any resources or training or support being directed to hubs to do, uh, to run field campaigns in their communities in a way that's specific to the needs and circumstances of where they come from. Um, and we just saw the need for something that is less one size fits all and more, um, you know, developing leaders at the local level who know their community the best out of anyone um, to like take, take control of how decisions are made locally. And so that being the context and the reality of local and state races um, being just so like this murky kind of fog with everyone really like all voters it's just very unlikely that you would find someone who knows about you know what their state senators platform is or about the city council race coming up and the differences in the candidates so and especially in young people it's just not accessible that information um, and we're not taught and taught it in school so all that being said, we said that this, this thing needs to happen. And also it's the strategy that is gonna help us defeat Trump in November um, because it's gonna actually turn young people out in ways that Biden himself can't, just can't do. Um, so we came up with the Down Ballot Disruption Project, which is a national, um, nationally coordinated but locally focused training program and coaching program um, where we train groups of young people, some from Sunrise Hubs and some not from Sunrise Hubs to do research on who is running locally and at the state level where they're from and then um, how to connect with their th those campaigns, how to um, roll out an endorsement and then how to wield that power that the endorsement has um, to get that candidate elected and also to build a community that will actually sustain beyond November 3rd and into the decade of the Green New Deal where we need to be actually implementing these policies at from the ground up. Well, and I'm on, I, I, that's where I want to eventually get to is some of the plans for the future for the, the groundwork that you're all laying and because I think that's really inspiring and I think everyone needs to know about it, especially young people so they get involved in this. But, um, I, and I wanna talk about organizing because that's obviously what you're doing. And I think that's probably something a lot of people don't understand very well as a way to get involved. And I mean, again, that it's not just casting your vote on election day. There's all the work that leads up to that, that so many more people can be engaged and, and be part of. So I want to I want to explore that a little bit. But I want to also take a step back and talk about the climate issue because that's what has really galvanized the both of you and Sunrise and so many people uh, this year. So I, what is it about climate change? I, you know, we've touched on it, but I don't know whether it was really said it in a way that people need to understand. Uh, climate change is an issue that's been around. I mean, it's, this is something we've been, some people have been talking about since the 1970s. More people are obviously talking about it now. Um, I know, Olivia, you and I talked the other day after the last debate that this election year is the first time in presidential election debates where climate change was even discussed. And in the last debate, it had a whole segment. So that in itself feels like a monumental shift uh, in, in awareness and focus on the issue. But w if we're gonna see record turnout of young voters, which it does look like it, it we're going to see this year, what is it about the climate issue, do you think, from your experience, from, what, from all your conversations with other uh, young people engaged now in the process. What is it about that issue you think that is so galvanizing for so many young people? 
Go ahead. You bought buy that you go first. Um, yeah, big question. <laughs> I think um I think there are a lot of different things that are involved. Um I think the the primary one is is perhaps the most obvious one, which is just that we are going to be living through the worst of it. And not only us, but um yeah, our children, our children's children. And it's like, I, I think young people have this concept and understanding and grounding um, that literally just comes with age and um, the context in which we've been born into uh, of what that will actually look like and um, what that actually means. And I've had so many moments and I know all of my friends, even who aren't politically engaged or in, involved in the climate movement, have had so many moments of like, oh, wait, I don't know if I'm going to be able to have kids um, or I don't know if my, you know, old grandmother's home, maybe it's my great, great grandmother's home um, is going to be in a habitable state. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to follow my dreams and go and live in Los Angeles and be in, work in the entertainment industry because it's always on fire and literally ha there's oppressive heat that has a direct correlation to mental health. And there's just this, there's, when you're thinking about the future, you think much further into the future than um, someone in generations above us think naturally. Um, and so I think there's this concept that we are growing up with uh, of this jeopardized future. And so I think that, yeah, is just something that drives drives the power of this movement every single day. Um, and it, it drives the power of it in a peripheral way as well. Like my, my younger brother is 15 years old and has nothing to do with politics or environmentalism. And yeah, he's, he has his own very specific interests. Um, and even he said to my mom one day, like, oh, wait, I don't know if I'm going to be able to have kids. And maybe that's because he has me as a sister, but I don't know. It's just interesting to think about the pervasiveness of this impending dread and doom that exists within basically everyone, um, you know, left, right, uh, of any background that every young person has. So I think that that is definitely the primary factor. Um, and as, in terms of like young people taking leadership in the movement, I think that's partially because of, of having that context and partially because I think older generations have yet to actually understand and find clarity in what their role in the climate movement is. I think there are a lot of folks who were part of the environmentalist movement and the first Earth Day in the 70s and that is, you know, kind of Greenpeace era um, environmentalists and I think uh, older folks like that definitely have an idea of, of what their role is, um, but it, even that is sort of dated. I think there's very much been a, a culture and um, a saying that, that older folks will say of like, oh, it's up to your generation. And the thing is, I mean, yes, <laughs> like we're going to be in power at the time where it's hitting the worst, but at the moment we're not in power. And so I think we've really stepped up into this role of no, actually, like it, it is our responsibility. And at the same time, it is still your responsibility. So we are going to agitate you adults who are in office right now or have financial power right now or whatever it may be to act yourselves. Um, and if you don't, we're going to vote you out and vote in either a better adult that has, uh, you know, is more grounded in these issues or a young person, which I think we'll talk about a bit later. But yeah. I think that's so, I think that's fascinating and so important. And, and as I come back to you, Olivia, I want to maybe focus that a little bit because when I'm listening to you, Violet, my mind is going back to other times, times that I've even lived through, and I'm one of those older people. But as reference points, um, that um, for instance, in the 60s, it was a generation of young people in the 60s who said, we can end a war. We can actually end a war, which was such a huge undertaking, you could say. Uh, when I was in college, it was end apartheid in South Africa and college campuses and young people. And I was involved in, in demonstrations in college to uh, pursue divestment by the university and companies doing business in South Africa to put pressure on South Africa to end apartheid, a huge undertaking again, which might to some people seem so huge that it would seem impossible. And now your generation, it's, it's climate. 
you know, old people, even right-minded, good-hearted older people get comfortable in with the way things are. And taking on something like the climate change issue, it's, you, you can't look at it around the edges. I mean, it's, you've, you've, as you said, agitate. It seems like it needs the way a younger person thinks and agitates that you have to think big to take on something as big as climate. Do you, I mean, do you find you're, you're working with young people, you're organizing young people, Libby, you're getting them excited, you're participating in marches and sit-ins and, and all kinds of actions that are drawing literally tens of thousands of people on what may be the biggest issue of any of our lifetimes. So it's not so overwhelming. It's not, it's, you know, in a different generation, it was ending a war. In another generation, it was ending apartheid. Maybe it is, it takes the vision of young people to convince the rest of us and show the rest of us the way how to think big about such a big issue. I mean, do you, do you think that's part of what you see and talk about with people you're working with? Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also feel like there's a clarity in young people that just doesn't exist in older people, especially older politicians that like, first of all, adults don't know best, <laughs> um, you know, and like, that's pretty clear with um, young people, young organizers and activists. And especially because so many of them are making decisions based on what is it going to do to their reelectability and what is it going to do to the funds that they're getting from you know corporations that are supporting fossil fuels um and industries that contribute to climate change and that's just like so mind-boggling to <laughs> me and my generation that that is even in consideration that like this is literally life and death and that we are not old enough to run for office but if we were in office we would be we would be making we would be changing things at the rate that it is that is life and death and so it's just so frustrating watching to watch and not have power to <laughs> run against these people um and that's where organizing comes in and that's uh oh, I lost your audio, Olivia. Hold on, Olivia. No. Oh, there you, I lost your audio for a second, Olivia. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, I was just saying that it's really frustrating to not have, um, like the power to d directly run against these people in office um, who are like supposedly fighting for the right causes and are Democrats and, you know, talk about, well, climate change is real. And then that's kind of the end. Um, but that's where the passion comes from to organize. And that is the power that we do have. And so people that we work with and who are growing up with the e with the knowledge that climate change is very real and so much beyond that already in their DNA, that is, you know, showing them that they have that power to organize, to elect people who will stand up to incumbents, to stand up to people who have reason to. All right, you're back. <laughs> when reason to not pass bold climate legislation. That's where the passion comes from. That's where we get people. And what, so, Sorry, that yeah, no, I don't, we just, it just went fuzzy for a second. It's okay. Um, so what, how do you, how do, it, all this sounds uh, like something so many people would want to be involved in. And you have, I know you're in a house right now in North Carolina uh, with, how many people are in your house from ages what to what? <laughs> 
there's seven people total from 14 to 21. So it seems, I, I mean, it's a monumental organizational challenge, I, you know, probably that most people don't think about when they attend a march or a protest, they just show up and, you know, it happens, but there's obviously a lot of work that goes into it to organize it in the first place. But you guys are, uh, and have the added challenge of pandemic, which we're still in the middle of. You can't knock on doors, you can't have rallies. You, I mean, there's just a lot of things that you can't do maybe the way you would have done them otherwise. So what does it mean to organize young people? What are some of the tools that you're using to, to help people to you know, have the tools they need to then go and organize other people? Violet, why don't you get, why don't you start yeah, us off? I want Violet to talk about how um, <laughs> campaigns this year are running like it's not 2020. All right. Second data and stuff. Yeah, I just, um, we've recently been talking a lot about kind of what this project means for the future. And I'm not sure if you have a question about it later on, so I won't go super in depth, but um, there definitely has been a realization uh, and Olivia, what you're talking about, about young people not quite being old enough to run uh, and primary a lot of these sleepy Dems, um, as well as, yeah, just like legislators in general who are, are blocking climate legislation. Um, it's been really shockingly exciting to come to terms with the degree of power that young people actually have in electoral politics. Um, and yeah, it's, I think there's definitely, there's definitely been a shift culturally on, on viewing the climate crisis um, just this year. And I think I was thinking also when you're talking about um, kind of former, former movements that we have really thought about and studied, like we're using tactics right now from the Wide Awakes, which were a youth abolitionist group uh, in the 1800s and yeah, have done a lot of studying and meditating on the civil rights movement um, and yeah, trying to, to have echoes of those policies. And I've also was thinking as you're talking about um, just how in, in this moment in particular, it's just a moment of such historic and record economic inequality in this country and the so many um, related crises have come to a head in this in this particular year. And I was actually looking at a graph that a friend was showing me last night of of the political tensions uh, compared with the political tensions of the Civil War, and it was at the same level, and which was pretty scary to think about. Um, but I also in that moment was thinking about um, something that a movement leader, Marshall Gans, said about leadership and the responsibility of a leader to agitate the public in order to get them to shift out of the status quo and open them up to new ways of thought and ways of ways of life. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's kind of what is happening on so many different scales right now this year with this election, but particularly within this concept of young people doing work in, in electoral organizing. I think this year has had an unthinkably historic number of high school age and college age students running campaigns. And it's been a shift from, oh, young people need to like, you know, get off their butt, stop being lazy and get out there and vote. And like, okay, we started doing that in 2018. Um, and obviously like, I think there, there've been so many youth uh, voter turnout efforts throughout our history as a country, but at least in this century, like there was a huge effort in 2018, an even um, larger effort in this election. But I think this election, there was a movement of, oh wait, actually young people have power because we know how to run 2020 level campaigns with a 2030 vision. Like we have the vision for what policies we need to pass um, that are not only, not only to meet the crises that we are facing today um, and the crisis we were facing honestly 20 years ago that we have been putting off um, legislating on, but also the crises that we are going to face in five years and 10 years, 20 years in our futures. We have that vision and we also have the edge of digital tools and digital resources at our disposal. Um, and it's been really exciting because I think, I think the next step is going from, okay, young people can vote and youth voter turnout um, is going to upset these elections and actually get leaders in office who are going to make change for justice to, 
okay, young people are working on campaigns and this is making campaigns better to young people involved in campaigns will win campaigns and young people who are running will win. And I think that is very much because we have been accustomed, we've, we've learned the language of operating online since we were babies, like since we were learning English. So it's so much more intuitive and it just, you have this natural ingrained entrenched intuitive edge that older folks can learn for sure. Um, and yeah, there are lots of folks who've been doing data science and computer science for a long time, but there are not many campaigns that are running at the level that they could considering the tools that we have at our disposal. And I think that's one thing that Sunrise does incredibly well. And I think young people around the country are doing really well on specific campaigns of playing into our strengths with graphic design, with social media narrative, with um, data tracking and using data science to improve age old practices of voter contact, um, make them more efficient so you can bypass the need for a ton of money to talk to a ton of consultants or buy a super snazzy tech platform because you can have a bunch of scrappy high schoolers with a ton of energy, really excited and really grounded in these issues who know the data science and know the technology behind it um, to, yeah, bypass all of those things and win grassroots campaigns. I have hundreds of followers on Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter. I mean, there was a, there's a great clip around the time of the debates. I think it was George W. Bush at one of the, his debates. He referred to something he had seen on the internet. <laughs> I mean, and exactly though that he was president, but you know, the technology, digital communications uh, is, is, is something that still people of my generation and older and younger too. It, to your generation, it's second nature. You've grown up with it. And, and it, as you said, it's intuitive because, uh, you know, you had a pacifier in one <laughs> and a cell phone in the other, really. Um, so, Olivia, what... Uh, how is that, again, how does that connect with, with where we are in the campaign right now, let's say, because we really are down to it. We're down to the last few days. So people who will be listening to this and people who are listening to this who have kids or know young people or have cousins and others in their family and friends and in their circles who, who they can get to listen and get involved, what what is the message let's say for for the next several days on this uh, you know that if you could talk to each and every one of them what would the, what is the message they need to hear and then i want to save some time to talk about where we go after november 3rd where you go i should say yeah um well first of all we need to make sure that everyone votes you know, that's pretty clear. And we do that by doing something called relational organizing. And to what Violet said, um, you know, upgrading these age old practices of like door knocking. And that is something that we can't do during the pandemic. You know, some people are doing that with masks and 10 feet apart. And, you know, that's, that's one way um, that a few campaigns are willing to do. But something that is even more ef effective at reaching voters and um, like retaining retaining people's attention with with politics is by reaching out to people who are already within our networks so that's what relational organizing is all about is using relationships that we have where there's some foundation of trust mm -hmm. um like it could be from middle school and you're you've already graduated college and you reach out to someone that you went to middle school with and you like, hey, it's been a while. What's your voting plan? Like that is so much more effective than a mass text going out from a campaign saying, hey, have you voted yet? Or do you have a voting plan? Um, yeah, it's like three times more effective than canvassing and five times more effective than phone banking, something crazy like that. So that's first of all what I'd say, if you don't wanna leave the house, um, if you're immunocompromised and can't risk, you know, COVID at all, then re make a list of the first 20 people that come to mind um, in your, who live in your state and see if they have a voting plan. Um, the second thing that we're pushing 
um, the people that we coach to do is to post up outside of polling locations during our early voting. And, um, you know, like 30% of people in 2016 didn't complete their ballot. And that's because they didn't know about the candidates running in down ballot elections. So you might see, you know, a few signs outside of polling places for Biden, for the Senate race, for, um, you know, uh, a, a federal congressional race, and maybe the governor, um, but you won't see signs for anything lower than that. Um, so just making sure that people um, recognize the name of the person that you have endorsed, that is even like what it takes to get that bubble filled in um, and make the margin of victory for that that candidate, or just encouraging people to just fill out the entire ballot. That's huge. What you post up at the polling place? Do you physically going there? And physically going a um, hundred feet, at least a hundred feet, right, from mm -hmm. the entrance so um, that you don't get in trouble for electioneering close to the polling location but yeah encouraging people like hey thanks for voting um can you like reach out to three more people and make sure that they're voting how, how has, has your family all voted um make sure that you fill out the whole ballot and um yeah so standing out there and having some kind of like merch on from your campaign, your down ballot campaign or a sign, you can make it really easily at home. Um, like I said, like name recognition is all it takes a lot of the time. And these races are decided by dozens of votes sometimes. So you can make a humongous difference. Right, and people have big lists. I mean, again, I, I mean, I don't, you probably have many multiples of my contacts in whether Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And, and I would imagine how, how receptive do you find people are to that? You know, if you're engaging one person, let's say, who says, yeah, I want to get involved in this, are, is that effective? Do, do, because it's so intuitive to, a younger generation, and I don't say that in any way to be disparaging. I mean, I think, I think your generation is the future of the planet, by the way. Um, but do you find that, how effective do you find that to be, that relational organizing where you might have thousands of followers on Snapchat or Instagram? Yeah, Violet, do you, do you wanna jump in? I mean, um, I texted someone yesterday and she replied from acapella, my acapella group in high school. And she replied really quickly and was like, yes, thank you for doing this. And come closer. Um, to sorry. Sorry. I think I'm, I'm playing with my AirPods case. So it keeps connecting. <laughs> That's my bad. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, she was really like grateful and said that she she had mailed her mail-in ballot yesterday. Um, so that was, you know, I I never talked to her besides just having her number in my phone. But yeah, Violet, do you want to jump in? Yeah, it's really funny that you brought that up because it reminded me, I actually had a call with one of my best friends yesterday and realized that um, I said, oh, I'm going to early vote. And I he said, oh, I, I early voted today too. And I realized that I hadn't texted him because he's voting in New York, which is not super critical for the presidential election, except that Cuomo um, reduced the number of votes that was necessary for a party to, like the threshold of votes that a party needed to reach in order to continue being on the ballot. Because in particular, the Working Families Party helped elect a ton of democratic socialists to the state legislator. And, and now the, all those people are working on um, electing a veto-proof majority against Cuomo. So he, yeah, fought back with that. And so now there's a huge campaign going to vote for um, Biden and Harris on the Working Families Party line. And I said, Jack, Jack, like, I'm so sorry, I forgot to tell you, but do you know by any chance if you voted for Biden and Harris on the Working Family Party's line? He's not someone who's into politics at all. And he said, I sure did. And I was like, that's so cool. How'd you hear about it? And he said, oh, well, Ella Stern had it on her Instagram story. 
And yeah, this was an old classmate of ours and he had just been scrolling through Instagram and saw it on her story. And it's something like that, that has such a radically profound impact when you have hundreds of followers who are like mindlessly scrolling through Instagram and see that and infographics like that really do work. And also I think we, we just know like young people not only know how to utilize technology and social media, but we know what our peers, like what will reach our peers. So we know that if we send out a mass text to young people, that's very formal and, you know, use lots of capital letters, people probably will read that, but maybe they'll ignore it. But if we send one that's much more personal, uses text language, um, you know, maybe emojis, whatever it may be, that's going to reach someone a lot quicker. And we also know that things on social media, there, alg there are algorithms in place in social media. So if you create a very kind of formal looking um, graphic, sometimes they catch people's eye, but oftentimes they'll get sent to the bottom of your feed. But if you post a video or you use like Instagram story or IGTV or Facebook TV, Facebook live, that algorithmically will go higher up in people's feed and is more likely to be seen. So there are just so many things like that where, um, yeah, it's just exciting to feel so powerful in these elections and realize that we actually, the, the millennial and Gen Z youth voting block is the largest voting block in the country in this election. Um, so it's just about turning them out and we know how to turn them out. And there's so many youth orgs around the country um, doing this work right now, so. Yeah. Well, of course the work- I also just quickly wanted to add that it worked at, like there's no better um, case study than the uprisings for the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives this summer, and how Instagram was so central to mutual aid efforts, to fundraising um, for families who were victims of police brutality, um, for like supporting protesters in the streets who are being tear gassed for like doing trainings for offering trainings on how to safely protest with you know like threats of police violence i saved so many posts that my friends would repost um or be like you know someone sent me this i'm posting it here um if you want an, an action step here's five things that you can do and i know so many people who have like their saved items are full of those things that you know got so much participation because they were blowing up on instagram that's I, I, that's fascinating because I've never heard that. I've never heard of the role of Instagram in that. And, and actually, that's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask you next, Olivia. But before I do, and we will say this again at the end, but if at this point there are people listening who want to find out more about what you guys are doing, give, give us the place where people can go to get more information, get in touch, learn about down ballot disruption, learn about sunrise. Go. This is it. Go ahead. Bye. Yeah. Um, so I would say just, yeah, search up down ballot disruption on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, we also have a website, down ballot disruption.org. Um, yeah, those are all the DVD specific um, handles where you can find out more information about the folks involved in our program and what our plans are for the next year or so. Um, and yeah, with Sunrise, if you look up Sunrise Movement on Google, there will be 8,000 million things that pop up. <laughs> um, so well, yeah, definitely. And I'll put in my own personal plug for this because a friend of mine, I won't get specific with names, but a very good friend of mine was telling me about his son, who's 17, lives out in the West Coast and was saying, he's got so much energy and interest and wants to get involved, feels there must be something he can do even during this time of pandemic, but he didn't know what to do. And we put him together with, with Olivia and they talked and now he's involved and I can report back. He's so happy. He's so excited by what he's doing. And so with, that brings me to the next question because all the focus right now in these next three, four days uh, is, is obviously on November 3rd in the election. But starting November 4th, you know, the real work is going to begin again, because even, even uh, if is, uh, I don't think there's any secret what I think should happen if, when Biden is elected, uh, you know, there's a lot of work that's going to have to be done. And what you're putting together, all the training, all the organizing, all the work and study and research, um, 
is building towards November 4th, not just, not, not, you know, you're not going to all just go home on November uh, after the polls close on November 3rd. So that would be a huge discussion, but give us, because I want people to understand how your generation is going to reshape politics and reshape this issue starting November 4th. So just give us some of the f flavor of some of the things you're going to be working on. What are, you, what, what are the agenda items? What do people need to learn more about, get involved in? Because young people are going to drive that train. So what are some of the things they should, that should be drawing them into this starting November 4th? Go, Libby. I think that goes in perfectly to what our plans are or our vision is for down ballot disruption for the next two years. Um, but yeah, November 4th, um, we need hundreds of thousands of young people flooding the streets and making sure that every single vote gets counted. Um, and to no matter what the outcome is, I mean, you know, hopefully it's a Biden landslide. Um, and in that case, we go out and we, um, you know, we say, Trump, your time is over and Biden, your time is ours um, and start pushing, <laughs> pushing um, him more to the left. Um, and we've been successful at it so far. His climate policy on his website is within, it names the Green New Deal as its framework. Um, moderate Biden, <laughs> you, know, you know, that he's been in, in federal politics for decades and decades as a moderate um, and is talking about the Green New Deal. So we know that he can be pushed and that's what we're gonna be doing from November 4th on. Um, yeah, to set his agenda for the first hundred days and his first term. Um, and from then on, you know, our plans as DBD is, like I said before, is having these sustainable communities that come out of organizing to get Trump out of office that then can, um, you know, level up their leadership even more in the, in the years that come and kick off this decade of the Green New Deal that's starting this year in 2020 by pushing for really locally specific hyper local Green New Deal policies. Um, because this Green New Deal platform nationally, federally doesn't mean a lot to, you know, the tiny town in, in Appalachia that is dealing with the, the fall of the coal, coal mining industry and is trying to rebuild into something better and safer and with better wages. Um, but a specific policy that provides a jobs guarantee for those ex coal miners um, and roots roots energy in in renewables and sets up infrastructure for that and speaks to the needs of like specific speaks speaks to the specific needs of those communities that's what people want to fight for so that's what we're going to be preparing the people who have been in our program for these past four months to do um, is to run as candidates um, and if not find young people, college kids, recently graduated college kids to run for city council and for school board. Um, we're going to have middle schoolers and high schoolers actually educated on politics and down ballot politics and how it all works at the local level and then have them run those campaigns and then have, while they're doing that, push through nonviolent direct action, those Green New Deal policies that pertain to their everyday lives and, you know, will set them up for an actual livable future, doing nonviolent direct action to make sure that those policies are implemented um, on day one of that young candidate's um, term. So well, that's the dream of what we want to do. <laughs> Well, it's a reality, though, too, and that's the thing. You know, it, it's um, you know, Bernie Sanders will probably have some role in a Biden administration. Elizabeth Warren probably will have some role. Um, other leaders, you know, many of them in that older folks' generation and even older will have a role. But uh, what I, you know, what you're making clear is that the voices of the people, the voices of this gen, you know, the Vietnam War didn't end because there was some right 
thinking politician at the top. You know, apartheid in South Africa, yes, had a big lead, had, had Nelson Mandela, you know, a, a world historical figure level leader, but he couldn't have done it without all the people who took to the streets in South Africa and in this country and around the world. So it's, it might be easy to think, oh, we've elected the right candidate or we're going to have this person or that person in the cabinet. They'll take care of it. They're not going to take care of it. They're not going to take care of it in the right way unless, as you say, hundreds of thousands of people get involved. And that's, that's it, it, it's not just a dream. I think what you're doing is making a dream a reality in, in a globe changing way. I think it's, it's, um, it's inspiring. I think, uh, my generation, old folks like me, have to uh, uh, listen and uh, hear your voices. Um, you know, what, 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 how would you address the challenges uh, starting November 4th, Violet? How do you, how do you see uh, your generation having your voice heard? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have to jump in a, a minute to another training. But um, yeah, I definitely, as as we were kind of going through these things, as what you're saying, Olivia, I was thinking about two quotes. The first being um, the night that we won the New Hampshire primary for Bernie, when someone got up on a chair and said, the victory, the actual victory of this night, isn't that we won for Bernie, even though that was a monumental achievement. It was that everything that we won and built throughout this election is going to be there tomorrow. And I think that's very much the story of this election and we're going to make it the story of many more elections to come. Um, I think also like young people throughout history have been the forefront of so many revolutionary movements because we're learning all of this history and all of the, you know, the inner workings of current events for the first time and having these like explosive energetic, passionate moments where of wanting to make change and wanting to affect change um, as we're learning all these things for the first time and also have this specific kind of in-depth knowledge that comes from, yeah, just learning and being in school. And so I think the next year is very much gonna be building this institutional knowledge of how to run these, um, you know, 21st century 2020 campaigns. Um, and yeah, I also think about this quote that, um, my step-grandfather said he worked with computers a lot in the 1980s and he said this thing once about how when young people when computers got in the hands of young people young people will change the world and he said that because we have never had more access to technology and resources than we have had today um and yeah, I think, again, learning more about those resources, how to use them to our advantage, and then kind of what, based on what Olivia was saying, going, yeah, being a part of these communities and um, doing this deep organizing in communities around, um, yeah, a culture first, politics second mindset of, of building strength in community and building political infrastructure in community and building support um, using community leaders uh, to around certain policy issues. And then once um, election years come around running these youth candidates who have this grounding, who are learning this information for the first time and who we can help train up with economics crash courses and with um, visual strategy crash courses. Um, because other than, yeah, we really have just the same right to be in office as the folks who are in office right now um, and will be just as effective legislators as the folks who are in office right now. Um, yeah. Wow. I hope to go. I'm so sorry. All right, so we'll we'll end it then. So, because I could go on for another hour, um, <laughs> Violet Barricker and Olivia Freewald, um, fantastic, amazing what you're doing. Um, I I'm so inspired by your words and by your actions. And uh, good luck in the next few days, and good luck in in the weeks and months ahead. I think it's fantastic. Down ballot disruption. <laughs> Uh, we'll put a link to it in the description for the episode, too, so everyone can get to it. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.